Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. I'm very happy to introduce you to Kaylin Tennant. She is a graduate student in um, the PhD program that's shared between the biology department at Case and Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. Uh, she already has a master's degree. Uh, her research interests at the zoo surround the physiological and neural drivers of behavior and how they relate to animal management and welfare in the zoo setting. So here she is, Kaylin Tennant. As they said, my name is Kaylin Tennant, and we are going to spend the next hour bringing silver back. So we're going to, oh, nice. Some of you got it. I like it. OK. We're going to jump into the world of gorillas, and I'm going to give you the ins and outs of gorilla life. OK, so the first part, I'm going to focus on overall primate evolution and some physical descriptions of gorillas. Then I'm going to go into gorilla ecology and behavior. And finally, I'll spend some time talking about animal cognition and then go over some specific cognitive studies using gorillas. So here we have a graphical representation of the evolutionary history of primates. The representative for the Homo sapiens may or may not be my six-month-old daughter. <laughs> She's so cute, I had to fit her in somewhere. OK. so. To get you all accustomed to this graphic, the bottom bold line, or the trunk, indicates time in millions of years, from farthest away to most recent. And then each perpendicular intersection, or node, represents the last common ancestor that that species that branched off had with us. So for instance, humans shared a, the last common ancestor with lemurs approximately 55 million years ago. To start out with, primates can be broken down into two groups. You have your prosimians, which are your lemurs, potos, lorises, and tarsiers. And you have everybody else, which are your anthropoids. Anthropoids, starting out, we have new world monkeys and old world monkeys. So new world monkeys are those from Mexico, Central and South America, and they include your capuchins, your marmosets, your tamarins, and spider monkeys. Approximately 25 million years ago, ago, the old world monkeys diverged and gave rise to the monkeys like your marmoset, or sorry, your marquettes, your baboons, your mandrels, and your lingers that can be found throughout Africa and Asia. A little bit of physical difference between old world and new world monkeys. Old world monkeys kind of have longer protruding snouts, more like a dog, per se. Um, their nostrils kind of face downwards. Whereas your New World monkeys, they have flat noses and a more broad septum, and their nostrils face forward. Next, we have your apes, starting with the lesser apes, the gibbons and the siamangs of Asia. Overall, apes are generally larger in body size than your primates, and they also do not have that tail that monkeys do. Finally, we have the great apes, which includes humans. The three non-human great ape genre are pongo, which are orangutans, gorillas, and pan, which includes both chimpanzees and bonobos. So both genetic and fossil evidence indicates that we are most closely related to that pan genus. So we share a common ancestor with them only six million years ago, and about 99% of our DNA is shared with them as well. Though 70% of the human genome is most closely resembles that of the pan genus, 15% of our human genome is more like a gorilla's genome than a chimpanzee's or bonobo's. And we share approximately 98% of our DNA with them. So as I previously said, gorillas are one of the four non-human great ape species other ones being bonobos, chimpanzees, and orangutans, as you can see here. The four great ape species, they are fascinating in their own right. 
they all each have their unique characteristics and adaptations that help them thrive in their perspective environments. One feature that's not necessarily an adaptation, but it's extremely interesting none the least, and one that I wanted to point out, are the fact that gorilla nose shapes in the lines right above their nostrils are unique per individual. They actually act like fingerprints, and that is actually how researchers can ID gorillas in the field, by looking at their nose prints. One example of a gorilla adaptation would be the opposable digits on both their feet and their hands. So this helps them improve their grasp and better manipulate their environment. Their hands, as you can see in the picture, are very human-like, but their skin on their fingers and especially their knuckles are a lot thicker because they kind of do the knuckle walking that you, I'm sure, have seen. Another example of an adaptation would be the shape of their teeth, particularly their molars. Because gorillas are herbivores or vegetarian, they eat a lot of plants and they need to have teeth shape that allows them to better grind up that plant material. Additionally, because they are vegetarian but not ruminators, meaning they don't bring up their food and re-chew as part of the digestive process, they have microbes in their colon that actually work to break down the plant cellulose material, make it into something that is actually digestible for them. That is done through a fermentation process in the gut, and for that reason they are called hindgut fermenters. In order to grind that plant material appropriately, they need really large jaw muscles, which are represented by this arrow. The muscles need somewhere to attach. So gorillas have a very large sagittal crest, which is that ridge of bone on the top midline of their skull. The sagittal crest and its associated mus muscle and fat tissue is especially large in the male, as you can see in this beautiful profile picture. Gorillas in general are actually highly sexually dimorphic, meaning that the two sexes look quite different from each other. The male is nearly twice the size of the female, so he can be up to 450 pounds in the wild and stand around 5.7 feet tall. In contrast, females weigh between 150 to 220 pounds and may get up to five feet. Aside from their overall size and that larger sagittal crest, mature males also have some other secondary sexual characteristics that set them apart from females. The most obvious would be that lighter saddle, um, which gives them their name, silverback. That lighter hair runs from their shoulder blades all the way down to their rump. Some researchers believe that it actually works as an optical illusion to make the body look longer. All males develop that lighter back, so they all become silver males when they mature, or silverbacks when they mature. That saddle begins to develop around the age of 13. Before that point, they are called blackbacks, and they actually look very similar to females, like the one in the picture on the right. Okay, so before we move on to the next section, I want, it's very important, to note that there are actually two species of gorilla, the western gorilla and the eastern gorilla. And moving forward below that, there are four subspecies, two under the western gorilla, which western lowland and cross river, and then two under the eastern gorilla, the growers gorilla and the mountain gorilla. Western lowland gorillas are the only subspecies housed in zoos. Um, there used to be one individual cross-river gorilla housed in the sanctuary in Cameroon, but she recently died in 2017. So now at this point, we only have Western lowlands in zoos around the world. Of note, the mountain gorilla is the subspecies that Diane Fossey actually conducted her research on, and her team spent years and years collecting very valuable information. The Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund actually still to this day researches those same groups, but of course, different members. Um, for that reason, this subspecies is the subspecies that we know most about from the wild. 
Between the two species level, there are some marked morphological differences. For one, Western gorillas are usually smaller in stature and they have lighter colored hair. So they're more gray, brown, compared to that stark black, dark color of the Eastern gorillas. Um, also, sometimes, you can kind of see in the Cross River gorilla picture, the Western gorillas will tend to have reddish tinted hair on their heads. And the hair of the Eastern gorillas, especially that of the mountain gorillas, are much longer to help them keep warm in the cooler temperatures that are caused by the higher elevations that they live in. Here we have a gorilla distribution map. So this, the whole coloration in this picture of Africa depicts the only places where gorillas are found throughout the world. The orange represents where the western species can be found and the yellow where the eastern species can be found. If you were to take this middle section of the continent and zoom in, you would be able to more closely see those stark differences in sizes of known distributions for each subspecies. So up at the very top left-hand side, just got circled, um, that small area is indicative of where the Cross River subspecies is found. That's only in a small area of Cameroon and Nigeria. Then you have the larger medium green color. That is the distribution for the Western Lowland subspecies. On the other side, that lighter, brighter green, that's where the Growers subspecies can be found. And then the tiny two red areas that are actually blown up in that square, that is where the mountain gorillas are found. So they're only found in two small locations, the Virunga Volcanoes of Rwanda and then Bwindi National Park of Uganda. And then because all subspecies are endangered to some extent, I wanted to provide you with some population numbers to go along with this landmass depiction. So for the Cross Rivers, we have only 300 individuals remaining. So if you think of how many people this room can hold, maybe twice the size of this room or three times the size of this room, and that's how many Cross River gorillas we have left in the whole world. Western lowlands, we have a little bit more. They are our largest abundance subspecies. We have around 400,000 individuals left. Growers, 3,500. And mountain gorillas just recently up the number to 1,100. Again, all of them in, are endangered to some capacity. Three of them are critically endangered. And the mountain gorillas were just recently moved from critically endangered to endangered last year. Um, that increase is due solely to the strong efforts and dedication that has gone into protecting this species. Um, this protection started back in the 60s with Diane Fossey. Because they have such a smaller sub or such a smaller population of around only 1,100 individuals, and because they have so many dedicated trackers, they are basically able to protect this subspecies on an individual level. So each individual gorilla is protected to some degree. Obviously, with Western lowland, it would be a little bit harder to do that because there are 400,000 individuals. I do want to note that even though there are only 300 Cross River gorillas left and 3,500 Grower gorillas, the Grower gorillas population is decreasing rapidly. And because of that fast rate in decline, it's actually, some people say that they're more endangered than the Cross River. Um, for that reason, the really dire state of the eastern gorilla species is the reason why Cleveland Metro Parks has decided to partner with Diane Fossey Fund in the past. Um, we as an organization really want to provide as much assistance as possible to help keep these gorillas around for as long as possible. So if you'd like me to talk more about that partnership, just ask me at dinner, or actually I have maybe a few minutes now if you have questions. I was curious about the skull because uh, the male ridge on the top of the head is larger than the females apparently from the pictures. So how do the females chew their food if they don't have these big muscles? They do have larger sagittal crests than us for sure. And they, it's still large. It's just relatively speaking, males 
are larger. And you want to also think about the actual muscle and fat tissue that's connected to that bony sagittal crest. That in itself could be more dense than the females. And it actually, if you were to like put your hand on your head and chew, you could actually feel your own. If you were to do that to a gorilla, you would really feel it. Oh, and what's the evidence in your level of confidence that that was 50 million, that was 40 million, and so forth? Could you explain yes. that? Yes. So that's a great question and not my level of expertise. Research tells us that based on fossil records and genetic information. So the way they do that, they can, use, they can look at differences between genomes and DNA sequences. They know that DNA base pairs mutate at a certain rate. So if they look at differences between species, they can guesstimate based on the mutation rate how long ago we would have shared a common ancestor. The same similar concept with fossils, they use um, information on radioactive isotope, isotope decay. Um, all different isotopes decay at a specific rate and we know that um, having studied them. And so if you were to find a fossil, you could look at the rate of decay and estimate how long it had been since it started decaying. So that type of information is used for these type of estimations. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Kaylin Tennant discussing the evolution of gorillas and their differentiation into four subspecies of two species. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Ms. Tennant will discuss how gorillas interact with their environment and with one another. Now, back to the talk. Next, we're going to cover how gorillas interact with their environment and with each other. Yes, this is an elephant, and yes, elephants do live in, with gorillas in certain areas of Africa. So because there is such a large geographical separation between species, um, Western and Eastern gorillas live in pretty different habitats. So Eastern gorillas live in more of that submontane, montane habitats. Um, of up to 30,000 feet in, or 13,000 feet in elevation. Um, where they live, they actually have two dry seasons and two wet seasons. So they get more wet or more rain each year, around seven feet annually. Western gorillas, on the other hand, they lived in mixed swamp or primary and secondary tropical forests of up to only 4,000 feet in elevation. Um, they experience one rainy and one dry season each year and get only almost five feet of rain each year. All gorilla groups, no matter the subspecies, exhibit somewhat synchronized activities throughout the day. So that can alternate between rest periods and foraging. Mountain gorillas feed mostly on leaves, stems, shoots, and other vegetation that is readily available to them. They consume very little fruit. Because they have such a diet that is readily available and easily accessible, they do not have to travel as far. So each day they travel maybe a third of a mile. Unlike mountain gorillas, western gorillas have very little dependable access to high quality herbaceous vegetation. Fruit, on the other hand, although it is dispersed throughout the region, is readily available and for that reason kind of acts as the central component of their diet, especially during the times of high fruit abundance, which would be those wet seasons, also known as fruiting seasons. Because of this reliance on fruit, Western gorillas have to travel a little bit farther each day and they can travel up to 0.8 miles daily. I think this graphic does a great job at showing the seasonality differences in Western lowlands. I'm gonna clarify it a little bit for you. So the X axis depicts months over two years and the Y axis is abundance of food type. So the green indicates how much fiber, AKA herbs and vegetation, was in the gorilla diet throughout this two year period, while the blue indicates fruit abundance. 
From this, it's pretty clear that the gorillas rely more on fruit during those rainy or fruity seasons and more on vegetation during those dry seasons. While I'm on the topic of diet, I'd like to take some time to put in a plug for my own personal research interests. <clears throat> so in the wild, gorillas diet is very high in fiber, low in starch, low in calories. In zoos, on the other hand, um, most zoos provide a diet that is typically high in starch, lower in fiber, and higher in calories. So around 10 years ago, Cleveland Metro Park Zoo completely revamped their gorilla diet to better mirror that of what is eaten in the wild. Um, the zoo completely removed the high in starch commercially produced primate biscuit that's normally fed to primates in a zoo setting. And they also increased the amount of produce given and the amount of alfalfa given. In doing so, they were able to see small improvements in health parameters. Specifically, they looked at and saw a decrease in insulin and cholesterol levels. Those factors, I'm sure you know, are usually associated with or can be associated with diabetes and heart disease. And both of those are issues in zoo house primate populations, specifically ape populations. While they did this diet change, they also noted a decrease in the amount of time that gorillas engaged in regurgitation and reingestion, which is a very puzzling behavior in which they bring up some food, rechew it, re-swallow it. Um, we don't really know why they do it. It's fairly common though in zoo housed apes. It doesn't it's not necessarily known to cause a negative effect on welfare, but um, it can be distracting and somewhat unsightly to zoo guests, and it's never been observed in the wild. So we know that for some reason this diet change decreased this abnormal behavior, but we don't know why. So as Kristen said, because I am interested in neural and physiological mechanisms of behavior, I will focus my research around this question. I think, fingers crossed, hopefully that we might be on to something but I don't want to jinx it. So perhaps if we are correct, I'll be invited back in the future and I can tell you all about how we successfully eliminated regurge and reingestion in the zoo gorilla population. Fingers crossed for it. Okay, in sum, I just want to emphasize that even though we don't have access to the over 180 species of plants that the gorillas can sometimes eat in the wild, we are very dedicated to providing the gorillas with a diet that functions like a wild diet. So this idea is somewhat represented in this picture with one of our past silverbacks, Beeback, chowing down on some forage that's very similar to that of the wild mountain gorilla silverback here, Gohanda. Okay, back to some wild ecology. The difference in diet composition can affect social behavior and group structure also. For instance, because the mountain gorillas eat mostly browse and vegetation that again is more readily available, they are able to form larger groups than western gorillas. So although all gorillas are social, mountain gorillas like the one depicted here can exceed 20 individuals in one group, whereas the average size for growers and Western species is around eight. The most common type of gorilla group is the mixed sex family group, which is made up of one silverback, several females, and all of their offspring. There have been some heterosexual multi silverback groups observed, but most of them occur in mountain gorillas. Both the males and the females in this species go through natal dispersal. So when males reach sexual maturity, it's much more common for him to disperse than to challenge his father, though it is common for some mountain gorilla males to remain in their natal group and attempt to take over once their father has passed away. This is not as common in the Western species. So upon dispersal, he will either remain solitary or he'll join in with a bachelor group like the one depicted here on the right. 
until he acquires females of his own. Females, when they leave their natal group, they'll leave around eight years, which is a little before they reach sexual maturity. And they will either jo join a lone silverback and create their own troop, or mix in with another family troop. They can disperse multiple times throughout their life, so secondary and tertiary dispersals are pretty common for females. Um, and if they were in a group with one silverback and that silverback happened to pass away, all of the, the group would disband, the females would disperse and try to find another group to join. The core of the social groups for gorillas is the male and female bond. This is reinforced by grooming, but more specifically by close proximity. It is extremely important for females to maintain a close relationship with their male because he provides protection both from potential predators and from infanticide. And of course, he provides mating opportunities. Female to female relationships, on the other hand, are not as stable. They're a little shaky. Generally, female gorillas have limited friendly relationships with each other and usually some aggression can occur between the females that usually has to do with access to the silverback and the silverback has to end up intervening and separating the females. Relationship between male gorillas are generally weak in those heterosexual mixed sex groups because there is competition for mating access, but relationships between male members of those more um, all male bachelor groups can be very affiliative in nature. They can socialize through play, grooming, and close proximity. Female mate choice is also pretty important for male gorilla society. So as females disperse and transfer between groups, it's hypothesized that they are seeking the optimal male. Those male secondary sexual characteristics that we talked about a little bit earlier may have also evolved from this direct female mate choice. So females prefer better males. It's hypothesized that those better males are the ones with that larger sagittal crest and those larger glute muscles. Interestingly, those same traits the male can use to kind of suppress the female mate choice. For instance, if a group were to come across another group, the male would actually turn around and direct most of his aggression towards the own females in his group instead of the incoming male to prevent her from moving on and changing groups. The majority of information that we have about gorilla reproduction comes from either the research from the wild on the mountain gorillas or from information that we know from the zoo house western lowland population. The first menstrual cycle for the females occurs around the age of six, but then she actually goes through a period of infertility that lasts around two years. Um, the estrous cycle is very similar to that of a human. It lasts around 30 days. For gorillas, there aren't any really outward signs of ovulation like there are in bonobos and chimpanzees who have those sexual swellings. And it's super hard to tell exactly when a male comes into sexual maturity because he can sire offspring well before he develops those secondary sexual characteristics. Mm -hmm. Babies. Babies are cute. Females give birth about every three and a half to four and a half years, unless an infant dies, unfortunately, then she could go into estrus sooner. Um, females will often give birth to only two to three feet or offspring throughout her entire lifetime. The gestation, again, of gorillas, very similar to humans, around eight and a half months. Gorillas usually only give birth to one infant at a time, though twinning has occurred, as you can see in this picture on the right. That is a mountain gorilla mummy with her two twins. Infant mortality, unfortunately, is somewhat high in gorillas. It can be up to 38%. For that reason, parental care is essential. Parental care, for the vast majority, comes from the mom. And she dedicates up to four years of her life making sure that that infant 
is well taken care of. Male gorillas don't necessarily take an active role in parental care, but they do play an important role in that they protect the infants and they also will start socializing with him when they get a little bit older in their adolescent stage. Infants are very, very helpless at birth. They weigh only about three to four pounds. They will cling to their mother for the first two months of life. They won't go anywhere but be on her all the time. At around two months, they'll start crawling and then start walking around nine months. Mothers, they'll nurse their babies for the first three years of life. And this time actually coincides with some coloration differences on the infant. First three years, the infant will have this cute little white tuft of hair on its bum. And that helps the mom and other members of the troop keep track of it when it's walking around. So these are cute babies. Now that I've overloaded you with cuteness, does anybody have any questions this time around? I was uh, surprised and pleased to see that you cited Disney in your work. Is that serious work that they do? Disney is involved in a lot of both zoo house research and conservation efforts. They have many, many pro programs and projects going on all the time. Um, we actually, our recent graduate, PhD graduate from the program just got a job at Disney. So he is working in the animal research department there as we speak. They do a lot of great work. So you mentioned the high uh mortality rate for the infants, what, what are the main drivers of that? Is it disease or accidents or what? That is a great question and we don't really know, especially that it's, there's a high mortality rate in captivity also. Um, we don't really know what's driving it. There are some research projects currently out there trying to figure that out. Um, in the wild, it can be disease, it can be elements, it can be um, the mother's first time having a baby. She's not really, she doesn't really know what to do at that point. Um, that's when the infant's mortality rates are a little bit higher with those first time moms. When the female gorillas disperse, do sisters ever go together to join another group? It has been observed before, but typically, no. Typically, they will disperse on their own and go to their various groups. You talk about them joining other groups. Yeah. This, would, this would assume that they live in a community and they're aware of other groups. How close are they? In other words, how much contact do they have at, you know, that they know where to go when they're ready to disperse. Yes, it is dependent on subspecies. Um, mountain gorillas, because they're kind of all up there in those higher elevations, the peak of the mountains, those groups are closer than some of the western lowland groups are. Um, but they definitely, ranges overlap. Groups are aware of other groups. They see them, they, there is interaction there. Um, I think a lot of people, maybe the media portrays it in this way, they think that whenever guerrilla troops come into contact with each other, there's this huge fight between the silverbacks and that's not the case. Usually, as, again, as I've already said, the aggression, if there is aggression, is the own silverbacks aggression towards females of its own troop. You were going to tell us a little more about the Diane Fossey Fund and the research you have going on at the zoo with them? Yes. So we have established a partnership with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Are you guys, how many of you are aware? Just hands of that program. Perfect. Okay. So that is still going on from the, the research that Diane Fossey herself established back in the 60s. We have a close-knit relationship with them in numerous ways. So for one, the conservation, one of our conservation programs is gorilla conservation. And so through the zoo, we're able to raise funds that go directly toward gorilla conservation and toward the Fosse Fund. Also, Kristen and us as graduate students, we work with the, the Fosse Fund on the memoirs program. So two times a year, we go to Rwanda and we actually help train 
the students in the local university there on how to conduct scientific research, why it's important, what's important about converse, or converse, conservation, and then they're able to take it back, and we do a lot of capacity building in that regard. So we want to conduct research on the gorillas, help conduct the research that they already do. They're doing a great job at it. We do a lot of capacity building, so teaching the locals why it's important to protect the gorillas, um, going over some methods on how they can do that themselves. We do education, again, by training those university students, things like that that really pull together the program, and we have this strong foundation between us and them. And again, Kristen goes over there multiple times a year. Laura Bernstein Curtis, who maybe some of you have heard from last week, she actually just went the beginning of this year. So she had lots of great stories to tell and I hope to go in the future. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Kaylin Tennant. Ms. Tennant is a graduate research associate at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and currently completing her PhD in biology as part of a joint program through the zoo and Case Western Reserve University's Department of Biology. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the environments that gorillas inhabit and gorilla behavior in the wild and in captivity. In our final segment, Ms. Tennant will talk about gorilla cognition, how they acquire, process, store, and act on sensory input. Now, back to our talk. This last section I'm really excited about. We're going to dive into animal cognition. Broadly speaking, animal cognition refers to how sensory input is acquired, processed, stored, and acted upon by an animal. A large amount of research over the past two decades has suggested that great apes kind of understand the physical world in the same way that humans do. Like us, great apes are able to understand the properties of objects, their quantity, order, as well as some cause and effect relationships between time and space. It's really necessary for them to be able to do these things in the wild. For instance, um, they need to understand certain characteristics about their food items, including their ever-changing, available quality, quantity, location, all of the above. Physical, that is physical cognition. Social cognition or the awareness of and information of transport between individuals is also very similar to ours. Great apes are group living animals, so social cognition is particularly important to them. Great ape social organization, or great ape groups can be very complex. Their social systems are complex. The individuals have to have different types of relationships with each other that require either collaboration or competition depending on whether their resources are limited or abundant. In understanding gorilla cognition, it's necessary to recognize that it encompasses all of these things. It encompasses the ability for a gorilla to learn, innovate, share, use tools, remember, and cooperate. In the wild, gorillas face daily challenges that require them to utilize these abilities to survive. In contrast, it can be argued that zoo house gorillas tend to live more of a bit structured and predictable life, um, in which sometimes these evolved cognitive skills aren't challenged as frequently or maybe as appropriately as they would be in the wild. As a whole, primate cognition is important to study because it can provide insight on our own evolutionary history of intelligence and human cognition. Zoos take that value and expand on it. They can kind of use cognition research as a means to facilitate public engagement in science and to develop new ways to positively affect animal well-being and welfare. Expanding on that, as I just said, it's very true that we learn more about ape cognition abilities, and we also, in doing so, learn more about the origins of human cognition. However, learning about their cognition also provides us with more information on what they are capable of and what they need to stay stimulated. 
zoos actually make really great living labs. And there's definitely a lot more opportunity out there for some partnerships to be created like the one between Cleveland Metro Park Zoo and Case Western. Implementing cognitive testing centers and cognitive research programs at zoological institutions would be just one more way to kind of forge those partnerships. Additionally, on exhibit research programs like this one shown here, this is actually at Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, those type of programs provide opportunities for visitors to actually watch the research as it happens. This helps them to become more engaged in the science that's occurring and actually kind of fosters, helps them foster an understanding for the animal itself. As a side note, education goals of zoos, I think, can be enhanced by programs that are exciting and that are relatable to the public. So the use of touch screens or technology can help generate such relevance. While environmental supplements like physical or feeding enrichment has been shown to positively affect the livelihood of zoo animals, the addition of cognitive challenges can further enhance the environment's complexity complexity and also just the animal's mental simulation. For that reason, both research and husbandry training can be kind of a form of environmental enrichment. Also, I think one of the most important effects provided by the use of cognitive studies is the provisioning of choice and control. So these dynamic natures of touch screens or other um, cognitive testing provides a plethora of ways for individuals to make choices and control their environment at that point in time and even afterward. But not only does it provide the animals with an opportunity to make choices, it also provides the zoo with an opportunity to learn information from the studies that can be used to improve animal management. Okay. Now that we have gone over some important gorilla life history information, as well as some basics on animal cognition and the importance of cognitive studies, I want to put it all together. So we know that gorillas need to travel over long distances, over varying topographies to access resources. We know that they need to understand time and seasonality and sequential events to a certain degree to know when and where to find food and other resources. And we know that they need to be able to categorize items. Perhaps they need to know whether food is of good quality or of bad quality. They need to know whether other animals are friend, foe, or competitor. So what cognitive tools do they actually need to be able to do these things in the wild? And what level of cognitive capacity do they actually possess in these subjects? I'm going to spend the rest of the talk going over some of the studies that ask these exact questions. The first study I want to go over deals with a cognitive test that I'm pretty sure all of you might be aware of or at least have heard of to some degree, and that is tool use. So tool use is a basically the phenomenon in using an item to accomplish some sort of goal, whether that be to acquire food, to groom yourself, or to defend yourself. There have only been three known instances of tool use in wild gorillas. And interestingly, all three of those instances were captured on camera, which is great. So these two depict two instances, and I'm actually gonna talk about the third one later on. The first one on the left-hand side is a cross river gorilla, and she is actually using a stick to kind of prop herself up as she goes through some aquatic plants. So to prevent herself from falling into the water. Next, we have a mountain gorilla. She's a juvenile. She was actually using a stick. She prepared it and used it to get some ants out of an ant mound. Okay. The first study I was actu it was actually conducted at Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, which is pretty cool, with the two silverbacks that they had at the time. The researchers wanted to examine causal understanding of tools and the resulting ability to use them. In other words, 
they wanted to know whether gorillas can choose the best tools to use. For the study, the gorillas were given an option of two sticks tools of varying length. The objective was to have the gorilla pick the tool and use it to get a food reward, which can be seen here. In this instance, it was a grape. The grape was placed directly in front of them with each tool at varying distances. So sometimes, some trials, the grape was placed far enough away that warranted the use of only the long tool. Other times it was placed closer to them so they could use either tool to get that grape. Then this platform with the tools and the grape was pushed up against the mesh where the grills were. I do want to note this did occur in the holding area for the gorillas. And I also want to just reemphasize, I know it was talked about last week, but all of the studies that I'm going to talk about, the participation in them is completely voluntary. So the gorillas can choose to participate them from the get-go if they're halfway through and they decide, nah, I'm done, I don't wanna do this. They can up and walk away and that's absolutely fine. There was actually a study again done at Lingen Park Zoo that found that Apes wanted, they decided to participate in their studies 90% of the time. So these guys, they actively want to participate. They're not forced in any way. I have a video for you guys. I'm really excited to share. Again, I said this was done with the two silverbacks that the zoo had at the time. This was before I was there. This first video is of Beback. We can kind of see how he responds to this tool task. There's no sound. Okay, so he already has the tool. There's a little grape there on the platform. He's trying. He's trying real hard. And alas, he loses it, and there he is. He's right there staring at that grape, trying to figure out what happened and why he doesn't have it in his mouth. Okay, so that was Beback. He wasn't the most proficient tool user there. But we also had Macolo. This is his trial. So that platform is pushed up against the mesh. He goes directly straight for that longer tool. You're trying to move that shorter tool all the way. Uses it to push that grape just close enough to get it with his fingers. Done, accomplished. That was easy for him, at least. Okay, so they did several trials like this. And in every single trial, he chose the big stick. Even if he didn't need to. Even if that reward was close enough that he could have used the short stick, he wanted that big stick. <laughs> Very similar studies have been done at other institutions and they have all found the same thing. Gorillas like big tools. So there were some researchers in Germany that actually took this a step further. They wanted to know whether gorillas would still prefer big tools if there was a cost associated with getting them. So this cost being the same setup, so there were two tools with a reward in the middle, except the longer tool was placed just out of reach. So if they wanted to gain access to that longer tool, they had to use the short tool to get the long tool to get the food reward. So again, there were varying trials where that reward was up close, that they could just use that short tool and it was farther away that they needed to work harder to get that long tool to use. And guess what? They like big sticks, but only if they're free. So this is some results from that study. As you can see on the y-axis, this is the percentage of trials that they use the long tool. On the x-axis, you can see that it's either broken down into whether that food reward was farther from them, so they had to use that long tool, or it was closer to them, 
where they could use just that short tool. And when they just needed to use the short tool, they did. So again, they like bigger tools, but they're also cheap. Good to know. The next task that I want to talk about is sequential learning. So that is basically the idea and the understanding that things need to occur in a specific order. In a direct sense, this is important. It's also thought to play a role in the acquisition of early communication skills. In a more broad sense, it's an important factor in understanding that certain sequence of events need to be considered and completed in a specific way in order for a task to be done successfully. An example of why this might be important in the wild is also the example of that third tool use, crossing a river. So if a gorilla were to come up to a river, she wanted to cross it, she would have to go through a series of events in her head. Come up to the bank, okay? Test the depth of water, which this gorilla did with a stick. She was actually using it to test depth. Is it too deep? No. Okay, take a step. Test it again. Is it too deep? No, take another step. That is how she got across this river. If you were to do this out of order, if she were to take two steps instead of alternating between taking a step and using that tool, she could have gone over a bank into deep water. Gorillas don't like water. It wouldn't be good for her. So a researcher at Lincoln Park Zoo, I have lots of Lincoln Park Zoo. They wanted to work off of this idea and try to figure out to what extent gorillas can perform this sequentialization. In other words, are gorillas able to list items in a certain order and remember that order later on? Here's the setup for the study. And this study actually occurred on exhibit. So we have a gorilla on one side of a mesh, touch screen with the sequential learning task and a researcher on the other side of the mesh. Every time that the gorilla would get the order right, it would get a food reward. The gorilla was asked to tap numbers on a screen in sequential order. Once she tapped a number, it would disappear, like in this animation. And she would then need to decide which number came next. It was, if she was unsuccessful, you would hear a small buzzard and then all of the numbers would reappear. Before she could move on to the next stage when another number was added to the list, she needed to get over 75% correct um, in three consecutive trials. She did this successfully for up to seven numbers, and then she kind of plateaued. But it's worth noting that she performed above chance on the very first session of each phase throughout the whole study period. This is a little pixelated, but I really just want you to get that the upward trend from this graph. So the x-axis depicts time, y-axis depicts percent of sequence correct. There's an upward trend which would, we would say, indicated learning throughout the task. Okay, the last task that I wanna go over is over categorization. This last study deals with categorization and conceptualization, which involves interpreting events and grouping items together based on understanding the relationships of potentially some physical attributes. I mentioned this earlier, but this could be an important cognitive skill to have in the wild because it could help them understand the difference between good quality, bad quality food, or whether other conspecifics or other animal species were friend or foe. For the study, the researchers wanted to determine and test whether the gorilla's ability to understand identity and relational concepts, again, in other words, they wanted to be able to tell whether a gorilla grouped items together based on some characteristics. They used matched sample design, which basically consists of pre presenting a subject, in this case a gorilla, with a sample, and then asking them to pick from two items which one closely matches that sample. So I'm gonna call for some audience participation before we wrap up here. 
I'm gonna ask you guys to go through some examples from the same task that the gorilla did and kind of see how we fare. We have a blue square. If you guys are given these two choices, how many of you would pick one? Raise your hand. Okay, we have some, good for you. How many of you would pick two? Okay, great. All right, now what about these choices? How many of you would pick one? Okay, how many of you would pick two? Okay, good, one. These choices, one, two. I think, I think we got a guy back there who's messing with me. That's okay. Okay. And this last one, if we have this as your sample, how many of you would pick one? How many of you would pick two? Ha, okay, okay. So not so sure about that one. I did this with my husband and my parents and they also weren't quite sure. They picked two as well. It's actually one. So we were looking for the same type of shape, not necessarily the same color. Point being, before we move on to the summary, is that this female, this individual, Zuri, she was able to do all of these tasks and perform at higher than chance, which would be 50%. The numbers in both of these tables indicate percentage out of 100. So she was able to do everything that you just did over random or 50%, and she actually did better at that last task with the two shapes, the relatedness task, than she did with the sameness task, which is interesting because the researchers hypothesized that that would be harder. And from what you guys did, I would also hypothesize the same thing for you. Okay, in summary, Gorillas are some of our closest relatives and they have some really unique adaptations. And zoo cognitive studies can help us shed light on what they are capable of and help demonstrate what I already know. Just how interesting they are as a species. Gorillas are amazing. The end. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.